With today's authorization, NACI is reaffirming its guidance on the use of COVID-19 vaccines this fall. NACI recommends authorized age groups get an updated COVID-19 vaccine dose this fall, six months after the last vaccine dose or infection. We will have enough supply of the updated COVID-19 vaccines to support immunization programs across Canada. I'm playing the whole thing this time. The Omicron variant continues to evolve with XBB subvariants such as EG.5 continuing to circulate in Canada and globally. Canada has also reported 11 cases of the Omicron subvariant BA.2.86. Just, just flood your senses with crap. This improved immune response is expected to better protect against the strains that are circulating in our communities. It's expected to better protect. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll get enraged and I don't want to start the morning off with an ulcer, but it might already be too late. If ha if ha it has been more than six months since your last dose of COVID-19 vaccine or your last infection, your protection from the virus may have waned. Mm. Receiving a COVID-19 vaccine dose this fall with an updated formulation updated. is expected to increase individual protection against infection, expected symptoms to. and severe disease. It's expected to. It, we, it may not. Who knows? <laughs> You'll find out. Trust us. This is six months and older. This is particularly important for people at increased risk of severe outcomes, mm. such as people 65 years and older, individuals with underlying medical conditions, pregnant people, and those living or working in congregate living settings. Mm. Vaccination in combination with personal protective measures are integral tools to reduce the negative impact of respiratory illnesses. This is especially important as we head into the colder months, oh, yeah. when people spend more time indoors oh, nice and the risk of respiratory illness increases. I, I just want everyone to appreciate, this is a new video. I said it yesterday, but we had to watch the whole video now. This buffoon, and I'm calling her a buffoon because I'm trying to be polite, is wearing what appears to be an M95 mask on stage alone. If she's got COVID, go home and do the press conference later. If she doesn't have COVID, this is psychotic. It's psychotic. It's not performative art. I mean, it is, but it's not. It's psychotic. It's delusional. They are pumping already. The, uh, it's just a magically updated COVID shot. Six months and older. We're going to talk about it today because the last time Neil Oliver was on, I, I, I have to go back and see when it was. I think it was close to a year ago now because it was prior to a couple of scandals or incidents that I knew I wanted to talk to him about. And the world has gotten worse. It has not gotten better. It's still darkest before the dawn, but when the hell is the sun going to rise? Good morning. Uh, it's been a back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back series of podcasts, uh, live interviews. I love Neil Oliver. M Millie, Minnie, sorry. You are not alone. Uh, it's going to be amazing. Neil has been on once before. We did the origin story. So now we don't need to do the origin story. Now we can just talk about the madness of the world, what he's been doing. And I uh, <laughs> love letter to the British Isles. We're going to talk some history today. So it's not only going to be uh, blood boiling, enraging stuff, but the Canadian government. That's Theresa Tam, the chief public health officer of Canada. Like a buffoon performative arts psychopath wearing a face mask alone on stage to deliver the message that a updated whatever the hell it is, it's expected to do some stuff. Take it and you'll find out. If you, if you, if you have, if you've, uh, what is it, more than six months since your last infection. Do you remember two years ago? They were saying it didn't matter if you got infected a month ago. Go get a booster. Go get a shot. Now all of a sudden, the wait time is six months after a prior infection. It's amazing. Science, you know, uh, it's enraging. It's enraging. And sorry, I, I might be coming off a little unhinged on Twitter. I, um, I'm no longer polite. I, I can accept that. Okay, Neil is in the backdrop. Everybody s will share away and uh, we're going to bring in the guest. Neil, you ready? I feel I'm ready, it. waiting and, and able, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. I say I'm trying to, you'll, you, you'll, calm, you'll calm the collective world down. Neil, first of all, okay, it's, I, I'm going to go back while we're talking to see when we did our first interview, but it's been a while. How's everything going? I can say right off the top, it's it's really, um, I can live vicariously through your tone of voice 
during the last two minutes there, because you are you are channeling uh, exactly really how I feel. Uh, that uh, urgency, that urgency in your voice is is wholly appropriate. Uh, for me, oh goodness me, like you say, we're going to check exactly when it was that we last spoke, and I very much enjoyed that conversation. And I only regret that we haven't had more conversations in the intervening period. But I, I think I think I possibly said at the time that I, f- I felt then as though uh, the floor had been kicked out from under my feet, and I was in free fall. Uh, waiting to land on something solid. And I certainly might have expected to have landed on solid ground long before now. Uh, But the truth is that in many ways, and most of the important ways, I feel as if I'm still falling through a sense of unreality about the, the, the madness that surrounds us. And as I did then, I do again now, I reach out to link elbows, you know, kind of, in the in the in the sea after the shipwreck, I look out to link elbows with people who are still who are surviving, and you are one of those. <laughs> I looked it up. It was ten months ago, October twenty twenty two. It was okay. before a couple of scandals, and I'll put them in quotes that we're going to get into. It's it'll be a year in October, okay. and I I remember what we discussed. First of all, I remember one particular story that I remember is the story of how you met your wife and how you met her before you met her, and. That was the beautiful white pill of that interview. Mm. And I'll give everybody the link so they can go watch it. But we talked about the same stuff and it, it seems to have only gotten worse. You're still doing the uh, your weekly monologues every Saturday night on GB News? Yes, yes, I do. I, um, I started in the, in the beginning of, of lockdown and, and pandemic and so on. I started with a really good friend of mine, uh, a, a, a podcast series, I suppose, uh, where we shoot the breeze, chew the fat, and I get to pontificate about what I think is is going on. And, you know, I started saying in that context what I thought was going on, uh, and I have continued to say that ever since. Uh, so I, I do some stuff, you know, online a few times a week. And then on a Saturday night on GB News, uh, I host a, a, a show and I have guests. and We, we uh, have discussions about the things that... I feel are amongst the most uh, pertinent issues, and I, I do I do get the chance to deliver a kind of a ten minute monologue at the top of every show where I try to summarise what I think is the worst of what's going on. I'm just, I'm still just doing that. I'm still just in that in that zone. Uh, I have my good days and I have my bad days. I have days when I feel bleak and I have days when I feel almost euphoric. And I pay attention to the euphoric days because this is this is this is from the heart. Even now, I feel even more determined than I ever did that we will get to where that we will get to where we need to be. I haven't really ever put a time on it. I won't say when I think it will happen, but I know that we will prevail because what we are thinking and saying is the truth. And and I cling to that, as I say, to continue that metaphor of, you know, the ship sinks and you find yourself in the water and you link arms with people that are that have survived it. And uh, I we will we will prevail. So that's where that's where I am. Good days, bad days, but I I remain determinedly optimistic. You mentioned my wife, and she is m- more positive by inclination than I am, which is in no small part why I am with her, uh, and together we know. We don't think, we know that we will get to the sunlit uplands. Well, I'll bring this up because it's actually on point. The white pill, black pill, red pill, I don't know what all these mean. The white pill is optimism, or at least something that makes you optimistic for the future. The black pill is cynicism, not to be confused with the doom pill, which is given up and, and gone to the dark side. And the red pill is being awakened to what is actually going on. And before we get into it, Neil, I'm going to end this on YouTube because YouTube does not deserve our presence. I'll put the entire interview like I did the last time on YouTube, but I'm going to end it on YouTube and go over to Rumble. So everyone, come on over to Rumble right now, three, two, one. The link is there, and I just shared it again. Uh, let's, let's, I mean, let's get into this. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm listening to you right now with uh, Dr. Malik, and that was from uh, June of the summer. I'm and it's Love interest, you know, it's, it's amazing. I think I'm going to be on, uh, he's, I'm going to be on with him in November. 
And I, you got to the part where you were talking about your respective spouses and like one of the devastating effects of this entire last three year period is the wedges that it drove between families, family members, friends, communities. Um, and, and, and luckily some got through that, survived, healed those, those bridges. Um, and Dr. Malik shared a, um, an anecdote, which I think is interesting. And, and you shared yours, which was you were always simpatico with your wife as your, your, your partner in this, as the world went batshit crazy. Um, how many, I mean, how, how many people do you know that have had personal family problems as a result of the last three years? Oh, more than I could count. I hear, I hear testimony all the time, uh, from, from those, uh, for whom the last three years, in most cases it happened quite early on, but there was a schism, a, 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 a gap, a, a space pushed between, a wedge pushed between. Uh, husbands and wives, you know, parents and children, whatever, within families. I, I said at the time, it, it didn't happen. F it didn't happen for us. But Trudy was even more determined than I was about what the, you know the path that we have followed. But but in shorthand, we were absolutely together. We've never had a moment's doubt or a moment's disagreement about it. Um, Within our within our wider family, uh, you know, other members of the family did different things than us. You know, other people, we didn't take the 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 products marketed as vaccinations, those jabbable injectable products. We didn't touch them. Our children didn't touch them, and we weren't touched by them. But within the wider family, other you know family members did. But even at that, it didn't it didn't cause a split. We remained all of us together, and that's been the absolute 100 percent 24 karat gold blessing as you you mentioned Ahmed Malik and I love him we we crossed paths I don't know within the last two or three years I don't I don't put a date on it and he's been one of the one of the 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 great powers of Ahmed is he is 100 percent honest and amongst his honest testimony, you know, he has he has spoken about the fact that you know you know that they weren't always you know he's, 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 he and his wife didn't always see eye to eye about it, but then they did, you know. But there was a there was a there was a period where they were you know uh, you know not in full agreement. It's fine, and then and then they and then they they were, and that's an amazing thing. Uh, and it's you know his his truthful honest testimony about all of that I find amongst the most affecting things about why I really rate uh, Hamid's testimony the way that I do. But in answer to your question, I am surrounded. We are surrounded by people for whom the whole experience of the last three years created a wedge, and I I honestly I can only sympathise with and and seek to you know, empathize with what that must be like, because I've always been in a in the, in a position where no matter what was being said to me or about me, within my four walls, within my immediate nuclear family, everybody was saying, we're right. <laughs> we're all in agreement. And that's been the, the wellspring from which I have drawn the determination and the confidence and the the reassurance and the optimism, because that be it be having having someone that you love that agrees that you're in agreement about a situation, it's it's impossible to quantify the extent to which that is more than the sum of its parts. I, I might as well be in an army of ten thousand, or three hundred Spartans, or whatever number you want to put on it. But the fact that in here with my family, with my wife and children, we've always said, this is the right, what we're thinking is the right way we're thinking. That's been a, a, a treasure beyond the value of gold and rubies. Now, I got, I got to ask you, because we're going to get into it, what people say about you on the outside world and, and the comfort that you have with the family that you see eye to eye with. And, and for those who... I think everybody's experienced it, but you can see when that, not an ideological wedge, but when you, when you view someone else and you think, holy cow, there's something fundamental that has come between us and between friends, family. I mean, I've seen it happen. I say I'm fortunate that I, it, it never happened with my wife and I might have been a little ahead of the curve in terms of, <laughs> because I spend more time on the internet, but uh, when she, she got there and we never had any fundamental disagreements on things that like 
constitute the basis, the foundation of our relationship. But when you see it happen, it's, it's sad, it's terrible. And it's something that I won't soon forgive who I blame for this. It's, it's, it's government in part, media in part. Well, you say, you know, you, you think you still talk every, every Saturday night about what you see going on. What, what is your overall impression about what's going on? Like, what is the, the plan? What, what, is, what are we witnessing now in real time? Well, I think we're witnessing the death of, of an empire. I think that the systems that have been in place for a long time have been uh, traduced, uh, corrupted, misused, abused, uh, advantage taken of them. I think the trust of the people in across the Western world and further afield has been uh, abused. Uh, I think that the in large part we have been damaged, hold below the waterline by the financial system. Uh, I came I came relatively late to paying proper attention to all of this. You know I don't claim to have known this forever. Uh, but fractional reserve banking, uh, you know, the way in which banking, a banking cartel in the form of central banks in Britain, in every European country, in North America, in the form of the Fed, uh, all of it coordinated by the Bank for International Settlements. Uh, the, the people uh, have been put into debt and debt has been the means by which the, the, the mass of the populations have been uh, you know, controlled and herded and and uh, made or invited to to, to follow the, the paths that have been followed by our societies here in the West. So I, th I think it has a fundamental uh, financial basis. Uh, there's also a, a profoundly anti-human ideology. Uh, without a shadow of a doubt, there's uh, within transhumanism, uh, and within the the climate alarmism, there has been for the longest time a message that's been pumped out about the fact that the human species is some kind of plague, some kind of mistake by Mother Earth, uh, and that the future would be better with 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 a smaller human population. I think that's undeniable. I think there's a message that's been pumped out for a long time to make people feel that even, just by being alive on the face of the earth, they're part of the problem. Uh, you know, people have been discouraged from having children. People have been discouraged from thinking that uh, you know the, this, the spread of human, human civilization is a good thing, and I think the spread of human civilization is a good thing. Uh, the the I think the plan is to has been for the longest time, and again. As I say, I, I don't claim to have been awake to this for very long, uh, but but having paid attention and and joined some dots, I think for generations there's been a a, a move uh, to undermine the confidence of the people in the rightness of the species to be here on planet Earth. And it's it's being we're being undermined by the climate crisis, which I say is a hoax. Uh, we're being undermined in all sorts of ways. We're being invited to split one from another. Uh, there, there's an attempt to atomize the species uh, in terms of races, in terms of religions, in terms of sexualities, in terms of nationalities. Every possible fissure is being uh, driven wider. Uh, but, you know, with, with a with a seeming determination to divide us as a, as populations, to divide us against ourselves, to divide us against the sexes and the genders and the religions, uh, and I, I think it's a whole it's a whole toxic cocktail that's been going on. That's anti-human, anti-civilization, anti the West, and the the sooner more people simply allow themselves to see what has been perpetrated against them, then in, in many ways, I think in the moment, in the moment that people say to themselves, yes, then it's over. 
I found it. I I found it extremely uncomfortable, not to put too fine a point on it. When I think about the extent to which, for years, I was oblivious, I was willfully blind, I didn't pay attention. Any any extension, any variation on that form of words you can think of. And when I finally admitted it to myself, I thought, oh, how do I make up for the lost ground? And it's very uncomfortable and it's embarrassing. It's even humiliating to, <laughs> to think. Well, I, was, I was duped. I was had. I wasn't paying attention. I was asleep. And I can understand. I can Because of that, I can understand why people don't want to go there. But once you go there, as they say... The truth will set you free. It, it is amazing. It's the Mark Twain expression that it's easier to fool people than it is to convince them they've been fooled because one is playing on their ignorance or gullibility and the other one is playing on their ego. And people are much more strongly clinging to the, the intelligence they placed in themselves to not get duped than the ability to get duped in the first place. And it, it, you, you say that like I, I recollect as well. I can go back to my conscious memories of politics being you know, convinced about the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, uh, weapons of mass destruction. And I remember the moving goalposts of the political discourse at the time where they said, Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, uranium enrichment, whatever it was. And then when they didn't find that, they said, well, he, he launched Scud missiles at Israel and those were weapons he wasn't supposed to have under the, under the UN treaty at the time. So that qualifies as weapons of mass destruction because they could carry payloads. And I'm like, okay, that, that argument is good for me. The war is justified. And the things that went on that you didn't know about at the time that were there if you were knowing to look for them. And you look back at all of this now and September 11th was, was, was Monday. Was it Monday? It was on Monday. And mm. um, I, I don't do those public posts about it, but I was you know, remembering in my own way and went back to watch a documentary from five years after, or it was like seven years after 9-11, explaining how Building 7 collapsed. And it was done by the National Institute of Stru NISR or some, some expert explaining that it fell because there was a fire and here's how it happened you know uh, unit, uh, instantaneous collapse structural damage across the building and it just collapsed on its footprint from a fire that burned for 24 hours knowing what i now know about experts and how things are commissioned and how studies are commissioned it's not to say that i think it was an inside job and whatever i just watch everything differently now and know that it has always been this way and it's very disconcerting to go back and like reevaluate your understanding of pillars of history um uh, with this new, you know, new understanding light that they've always been lying to, to some degree or another. Um, but yeah, I, I asked you before, like, we're going to get into the fall of Rome and then we're going to get into some other stuff. But like, it, the, you see, you see this as the fall of Western civilization. What, let's say Western civilization falls, what follows from that? Like Rome fell, Rome collapsed, but you know, then out of that was born, I guess, Italy, if a part of it was Italy, and I don't know what happened to the rest of the Romans. Rome fell, but Romans didn't die. If the West falls, what happens? You know, what is the uh, phoenix that rises from those ashes? My goodness, what a, what a question. Um, I, think, I think part of the answer, or if not the answer, the context for an answer, is that... Um, an empire, like any other entity, just runs its course. It has to. And, and history has shown us as much. You know, there was, there were, you know, there was Babylonia. You know, there were empires of a sort, you know, in the old world of Mesopotamia. You know, and the, you know, the Egyptian civilization held itself together for thousands of years. It's, there's, no, there's no underestimating the... The, uh, the the continuity and the and the consistency are there. Uh, there was a there was ancient Greece. And there was Ro and then there was Rome, but all of them run their course. Rome, you know, uh, Gibbon wrote volumes about the the decline and fall of of the Roman Empire. But it, in many ways, it it came down to explanations that most most people would would assume actually or conclusions that they would draw themselves that there's a there's a level of exhaustion that comes in and and there's an and there's an element of overreach that comes in and and there's also you know you have eventually you have too many generations of 
of people born into a situation who are invited to take it for granted. They think, well, there's always been this cohesion that, of, of Pax Romana and the Roman Empire and so on, and therefore it will always be there. But it, in, that, in that assumption, in that taking for granted, lie the seeds of, of decay and destruction. Because something as cohesive and big as the Roman Empire is a miracle, a magic spell that in reality has to main, be maintained every hour of every day, really by the recitation of incantations to keep it going. And, and as soon as you get enough generations, one after the other, who just assume that Rome will always be here, that's it. That's it. It's gone. And it, you know, Kenneth Clark, who was a, a, a British art historian and, and critic, you know, he, he wrote at length in the 1970s about how civilizations, wherever they are and whenever they are, they fall not because of pressure from outside, not the barbarians at the gates, but because of a kind of exhaustion. They just become internally exhausted. The other factors play in misuse of currency. You know, Rome had, you know, had exported all its gold to buy uh, pepper from India. <laughs> they had overspent on the luxuries of life. There were all, all sorts of things that they did themselves that 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 played into their to their uh, to their fall, but in the at the end of the day, it was an exhaustion from within, where people just can't be bothered with the thought of another of tomorrow being like today, and there's there's a lack of confidence that means that they don't plant the crops because they don't think they're going to be here in a year's time to harvest them. There's just an, an an existential ennui that sets in, and after 500 years of Rome, it just people forgot what it was, like like, like a kind of civilizational Alzheimer's, a, a kind of dementia, a kind of Joe Biden. They just oh, forget. <laughs> well, it, they forget. They forget who they are. And they forget what they're supposed to be. And so that's what that is more or something like that is happening here. We live, we've lived for the longest time. You and I grew up in a world of, of miracles. You you walk out your door and you go to a bus stop and it says the bus will be here in four minutes' time, and so it is. And you go to an ATM and you put in your card and you ask it for 550 pounds or whatever, and you and it gives you it. And you don't give a thought to the miracle of organization and order that facilitated and made possible such wonder that in the wider world has never happened. That world, that, that what we have taken for granted here for just a few generations is a, of soap bubble fragility. It's so inconceivably unlikely that any group of people would have far less maintain the wonder that we have had for a, a few generations the wonder is that it lasted for more than a day, and yet it has lasted for long enough for your generation, the generation above, and the generation below to think, buses just come. There's just money in the in the in the ATM. There's just food in the shops. But once you get to that point where enough generations in a row have taken all of that for granted, the soap bubble just pops like it was never there. That's where we are now. That's what happened to Rome. Now, I've heard a bunch of people, and I listened to a 62-part miniseries of The Fall of Rome when I drove back to Montreal last summer, and uh, or this summer. I forget who did it, but it was not a traditional explanation of The Fall of Rome. I'll, I'll try to forget the guy's name. Um, but a lot of people say, like, as Rome began to fall, uh, or fall, the decline of the Roman Empire, people were focusing on gender, sex, all of these other, you know, all of these, these superficial... Um, non-essential um, aspects of civilization, but I didn't get any of that from the podcast that I heard. Is there any truth to that? Like th that Rome became totally obsessed with sexualizations, um, gender, all these other things that yeah, prior yeah. to the fall? There are certainly, um, I mean, there are, uh, there are academic papers. I mean, I don't know, maybe you want to apply the word esoteric to some of it, but th there are certainly studies that have been done that show that Let's say you take statuary, you know, the statues on plinths uh, from, 
from from the high point of Rome. Yeah, I don't know, maybe the well, at various points. The statuary, let's say, men are men, warriors, shields, spears, figures on horseback, un, un, unmistakably male, masculine, and women are women, and they are depicted as as uh, as icons of femininity. Uh, you know. Uh, in ways that everyone can imagine and can see. And then as Rome uh, approaches, gets closer to its decline, there is an androgyny that comes in. And so that the statuary becomes where the, you're not quite sure instantly when you're looking at a figure, which sex it's meant to be. There's a blurring, a kind of an effeminacy if it's male or a or an androgyny around around the women, and so it has been it has been suggested by academics and well uh, art historians in the past that when something's in when a society is is moving in a way that's a bit well uh, fragile, you get a a, la, a loss of confidence in in depicting what men are and what women are. So obviously, fast forward to our situation, you know, so that you get the trans uh, uh, ideology that says, "Well, it's it's anybody's guess what you are really." You know, you just pop out of your of the of someone's uh, you know bonus hole, and you're called a <laughs> and you're called a this or a that, and it and it's a it ha- and it happens quite quickly. There's this kind of loss of loss of confidence, loss of confidence. And, and yet still, I mean, the 90, 99% of the population of Britain or Canada or anywhere else are still going, no, no, I know what a man is and I know what a woman is and there, there's only two kinds and, and whatever. The, the extent to which they might have been bullied or persuaded or or, or frightened into uh, not saying what they know to be true, that's, an, that's another matter. But, you know, in the privacy of their own homes or inside in the privacy of the insides of people's own heads, they know what they know about men and women. So yes, that without a shadow of a doubt, that that has happened, and and it, I mean it happens. You go back through, never mind Rome. You know, you go back to, uh, you know, ancient Mesopotamia, back into you know the territory between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, kind of uh, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. That, as we understand them, that 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 patch on on the dry land of of planet Earth, and you get. Um, uh, you get the the uh, you know you get the, the poetry of Enheduanna, and she's the first named poet. She's the first person who, who whose name is remembered alongside the work that she created, and she's like four and a half thousand years ago, and she's writing poetry about the goddess, and the 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 priesthood, and the and the priestesses, who were in the service of the goddess, made a point of androgyny. They dressed and styled themselves in such a way that it really wasn't distinct whether you were looking at a man or a woman in service of the divine. And well, that civilization failed a long time ago. <laughs> you know, it went over the hill into history, you know, at a time, you know, before the Old Testament. And it's, you know, so it, it happens again and again, where there's a a, a, a civilization rises like a puffball and a like a fungus in them. It comes up quickly, and then people forget how it happened over a longer period of time, and during that period of forgetting, then you get a you get a blurring of all sorts of things, a loss of memory. A loss of distinction, a loss of definition. People go, men, women. It, What's the truth? And it, and it drifts, and then and then that civilization's gone. Well, it, it is. I, I've always said and thought, you know, like humans need problems to solve. I think it's in the chemistry of the brain, and when they don't have problems to solve, they'll make problems in order to be solved. And I said the best example was a puzzle. Like you know, someone was sitting around one day and said. I have nothing to do, so I'm going to take this perfectly good image, break it into like many intertwining parts, take it apart, and then spend the better part of the day trying to put it back together. 
And so, you know, once humans, uh, I say, take for granted, you don't need to plant your food. You don't need to worry about sustenance, but you need to find something to worry about. We're sexual creatures. So let's look inwards and let's start thinking about what's going on in my head, what's going on, you know, and then it becomes an obsession over creating a problem to solve because you don't have real problems to solve. And I say that in quotes. People, people that, you know, I mean, I, I do. I mean, I've, I've probably got, I've probably got it on my desk somewhere because it's a book I, I kind of live by. I can't, I can't see. Oh, there it is. There, actually. Now I need to see what this is. The... Eric Hoffer, the true believer. Thoughts on the nature of mass movements. Right now, it throughout history, there have been movements to galvanize whatever, wh however many people you need and to take them in a different direction. It's the, these movements are driven by people who in them, in and of themselves are disaffected. Uh, they've, they've lost interest in and confidence in the society in which they find themselves. And so, you know, the, the various characters, whoever you like, you know, Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini, whatever the, the cast is long and of, of people who decide to take their, their, their it's Stalin, Lenin, people who decide to take the, their population in a, in a different direction. And, they, and these, these are mass movements and they are always the same. Look at the book. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about a uh, national socialism or, or fascism or communism or, or whatever. They have got fundamental things in common and it's things like uh, persuading, seeking to persuade people that their past, and that includes their family history, but also their white, the wider history of their country, is shameful, dishonourable, only made of mistakes. So, so you persuade people that what they come from, their own personal roots and their wider national roots, are shameful. Just something that would just be better to be put in the bin. And you, you also, at the same time, you persuade them that even the present is unsatisfactory. It's not good enough. And once you've done that, once you've uh, deracinated people from their roots, broken them away from the past and even from the present, you sell them the utopia of the future. And the future is always an easy sell because it hasn't happened yet. You can tell people anything about the future because it's not there. You just... You just make promises about it, and you, the, and it's true of all the of all these mass movements, all these popular movements. The people that were instigating uh, instigating one sort of movement or another at the same time. So so let's let's imagine that in the in the twentieth century in, in Europe and and well Russia, you've got people pushing for fascism, Nazism, and communism all at the same time, and on the face of it, you would say they're very different ideologies. But the, the people, the, the, end, the three individuals, if you like, selling the three different mass movements understood absolutely that they were competing for the same people. S someone that was just about to become a communist was just as likely to become a Nazi or, 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 a, or some other form of fascist because they were, they were dissatisfied with their society, with themselves, you know, they, they want to put themselves in the past and, and, and rather than fix themselves, you know, rather than, like, like Jordan Peterson said, you know, rather than make their bed and, and rinse a cup and sort out their own lives, they just put all that behind them and, and think, yes, I'll just, I'll just get in lockstep with this ideology. And they're, they're, it, it's a hair's breadth whether they become a fascist following Mussolini or a communist following Lenin. They just want something that lets them put themselves behind and lets them advance towards a utopia. And so, you know, have a look at that book. It's only a, it's only a short book. It's only a short read, but it explains so much about the tactics that we're seeing unfold around us. You know, we're here in Britain. We're being invited to think that everything about British history is shameful. Yeah, and I'm, I don't know, you could you tell me, but we're, we're being invited to think that our own pasts at the family level and at the national level are just, oh my God, let's what never thing? mention that again. And let's just look to this bright, this bright, sustainable, 
uh, uh, diverse, uh, equitable future that we can all share. And it's bollocks. As, as you say this, and like, it, it's amazing, it's pieces of the puzzle are clicking together. Um, the, the, the distinction between what you describe as you know, I think to religion, Christianity says you're born with the with original sin, but you look inwards to fix it versus what you're describing. And it's exactly what we're going through in Canada. We're all disgusting sinners with awful histories. But instead of looking inwards, look forwards to the future that Trudeau is promising that they're promising in Britain. And the difference between religious, you know, bettering yourself versus fascist destruction of society, communist destruction of society and how the how the liberal mindset I was shocked and uh, dismayed to see how it quickly became a fascist mindset in the context of COVID. And you, I'm going to go get that book on Audible. I hope it's on Audible because I can't read, yeah. but I'm getting it. <laughs> it, it is. It's there. Oh, I, I mean, what you describe is it's it's fascinating, and it explains the difference between the, the, you know a religious perspective of okay, we're born with sin, but we look inwards to better ourselves, versus our our ancestries are sinners, this and we must destroy it. There's something. There's something. I mean, other people, wiser people than me, said. You know, long long ago in this COVID debacle, that there was a religiosity about it, and you could see it manifest in uh, you know covering the face, or, or or at the very least a kind of a, a a style of clothing, an item of clothing that you had to wear to demonstrate to everyone and anyone that you were part of the good people. You were amongst the converted. And, and there was also the the the, her, the heretics and the, who were the bad scientists who were questioning things, and there were the good scientists who were trotting out the dogma, every you know at every available moment, uh, and, and there were and there was the the communion wine, the Eucharist of the of the injectables, because because people weren't just taking it, they were posting photographs of themselves taking it. Or celebrating the fact that they had had it, because m perhaps more than taking the communion wine, it had to be a public theatre. You had to be seen to be doing it amongst other people. I have, I have done the good thing. So there was a religiosity about all of it, and it's still going on. People are even almost, they're almost on the point of saying, I know the masks don't work but wearing one still makes me a good person. Even, there's, even though there's no identifiable, measurable function, just by donning this garment, I am declaring myself to be amongst the converted or the blessed, and, you know, and so on and so on. And it's very interesting, you know, when you look at, the way in which down through history, you know, science and reason and enlightenment, well, they are what they are, but they are readily subverted if ever and whenever powerful people just need to make a different point in a different way. You know, I was, I was, uh, you know, I've got, you know, I've got a podcast that I do every week, you know, it's, it's history, it's moments in history. And I, I was talking this week about the, uh, the execution of a woman called Anna Goldie in uh, in Glarus in Switzerland in 1782, and she was the last European person to be executed for witchcraft. And she had had an affair with a married man. She'd been the nanny of the family, and she'd she'd had an affair with a, a, a wealthy local advocate whose children she was looking after, and he was married. So it, was a, it would have been, could have been a scandal. But very, very quickly, he was able to have her accused of being a witch. And she was tortured multiple times into a confession. And having confessed and put her name to it, she was marched out into the town square and beheaded by a man with a sword. I mean, talk about cancelling and silencing. But she was a, this was a person who had challenged authority. And she was done away with. This is 1782. I mean, in 1782, Great Britain recognised the independence of the United States and the founding fathers were talking about the equality of all human beings 
and the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and all of the rest of it. The you know the the, the uh, you know scientific societies in England were were publishing works about observing meteors in the sky and contemplating the natural philosophy of the cosmos, and at the same time, because it suited someone in power. A woman was convicted of witchcraft and had her head cut off and she was buried in an unmarked grave. And so whatever, even whether it's the 18th century or the 21st century, if, if powerful people, people with the levers of power, decide that they need to achieve an end because it suits them and it preserves their position, they'll subvert and traduce science and reason and the truth. And they will use the bullying tactics that people in power always use to persuade other people around them to keep their heads down at the, while they're doing it and say, yeah, yeah, that's right. And just put the mask on, take the magic juice, you know, stand six feet apart in the supermarkets, follow the arrows. It, they know it's bollocks. Some of them don't, but most of them do. They know it's bollocks. But they do it because it's the, it's, it's the safer way. And they do it in the knowledge that they're, they're allowing everything that science is supposed to be about, the pursuit of truth, observation, asking questions. They allow all of that to be set aside because some wealthy people have an objective. And in order to maintain that objective, in order to achieve that objective, out the window. I, I need to see you, you say this. And as you say this, I want to see if I can pull up uh, the, the religious uh, religiousness. I see the thing is I I'm reluctant to not, not, it's not analogous, but there are definitely similarities, but there's, there's a useful, practical, pragmatic, uh, ethical value to religion that there has not been in any of the religious type um, behavior of COVID. But there was that, that Dina Hinshaw was one of the, the Alberta chief medical officer apply, doing a ritual as she put on her mask, took it off to give a speech, it was both psychotic, but also like the, the worst elements of religion with none of the good stuff about, uh, that's amazing. So, so they, were, they were executing people for witchcraft in Switzerland uh, across the world. And this was not a purely Salem type thing. No, no. I mean, that, that, um, that application of, of that particular power over people, well, like 1782 is the last person, Anna Goldie was the last person to be executed in, in Europe for witchcraft. And, you know, I, I, have, to, I have to stress as well that uh, people of faith throughout this period, people of genuine faith, heartfelt, be they Christian, be they Muslim, be they Sikh, have contacted me directly, not because of their faith, but inter alia, in, it, in telling me their stories about what they've been through and, and how they found the strength to do what they did, they invoke their faith. And they talk about uh, the, the fight between light and dark, good and evil, and how at times when they felt otherwise entirely alone, they were able to draw upon their faith. And I accord with that 100%. You know, and I am a person of faith as well. I don't when I when I'm talking about the religiosity that was used to push uh, the the nonsense of the of the COVID debacle, I'm talking about the traducing and the and the misuse of faith. You know, you, you know that's it, it was pure theatre. It's a zombie faith. It's a parasitic faith. It, it's it's looking at the way in which the people of faith uh, live their lives and and make sense of reality in the universe and cynically manipulating that and aping it you know and so inviting people to do the things that that, that religious people do so that the, the, the face coverings and the and the and the and the injectable communion what? As, yeah, a, as a as a tragic as a traducing of Eucharist, that that, that is a that's a zombification of everything that it means to be a person of faith. Look, I mean, you say this, and what, I don't know if you've seen this particular clip. Zombie zombification. Look at this. This is the chief medical officer of the province of Alberta. Takes off her mask, 
She had just disinfected her hands. Disinfects them again. Okay. The, I mean, the, <laughs> it's, it's it's pure Hello, cult. Everyone, and thank you for Good coming today. She talks. And I will now turn the Nobody else came up on stage, Neil. Puts it yes. back. Disinfects. Puts it back on. Look at how she puts it back on. And then, does she disinfect her hands again? No, not this time. Then this woman not wearing a mask. I mean, you met, you say it, and it's... Oh, let me just... Huh. Let me just Psychotic. She has to do it too. Do it. Make sure everybody hears you. Like, thank good. you, Doc. Oh God. It's um, the. It's absolute. It's absolute theatre. You know that. That's what I mean. You know where 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 people. I mean people. I'm sure people of. I'm sure very many people of faith. Genuine people who who believe, looked on at the way in which, uh, the 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 visuals, that are. Ex outward expressions of faith were manipulated and misused. I'm sure many, many people looked on and made the same, you know, made the same connections that I did and were, were very upset, offended, heartbroken or whatever by what they saw. But, you know, when you, in the Eric Hoffer true believer context, when you, when you look into it, you know, it's, it's just the way in which the, the tools, the, the means of manipulation are cherry picked from wherever they need to be and brought together, you know, so that so that people can be can be shamed or pushed or ridiculed or or otherwise persuaded into following a path. It's very dark. It's very dark behavior. It, it, w w w w without a doubt, without a doubt, part of what we have to contend with at the moment is the the whatever you think of the one world government or the have have accepted that there is a need a genuine honest need for a kind for for religion for the i'll take it religion is a there's a genuine sense of the transcendent that most people alive in the world today have some kind of sense of the transcendent many people don't that's equally you know, legitimate and not a problem, but many people do. You know that um, the thirst, the thirst that from the the soul doth rise, doth ask a drink divine. There is there is something within most people that finds its answer in the invisible or the or the transcendent, however they interpret and and draw it d down up upon themselves, and the the. The one worlders or the cabal or the or the one world government or whatever have recognized that they need to give people something to fill that void. They don't want them to be Christian or Muslim or Zoroastrian or any other bona fide faith. They they think, right, as part of this movement, as part of taking control of people, we'll give them something to believe in. And you're seeing the you're saying, they're bringing out the, you know, out, out come the boosters now or whatever. You know, the, the injectables are coming back out because in terms of that, that zombie parasitic uh, tra uh, tragicing of a, of a religion, they're going to say, right, people, it's time to come to communion. It's time to walk up the nave and take of the, take of the blood and eat of the flesh. And then you'll have shown the rest of the congregation and the wider population that you are one of us. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I had a Dave Smith on last night and his, his, I asked him about the black pill because I've been feeling like not despaired in any nefarious way. My, my biggest fear in life is death. No matter like it's an irrational fear of death, but his white pill was the, you can't take a black pill. It's lazy. And, and his white pill was uh, the economist Von Mies who escaped persecution, came to America, wrote, you know, learned another language, wrote books. And I'm like, well, that's the, he did that while 80 million people died under Stalinism and, and fascism. That's still, that even that white pill is but the tip of an iceberg of a big doom pill, black pill, because that white pill is in the, in the backdrop of, it tens of millions of people die because of these, uh, call them social, contagions these these social trends and then you know you come out of it and so societies collapse and out of them come i don't know fragmented societies smaller societies 
So you're not okay. It's it's nice. Um, yeah, I'm not feeling much better. But the one the, you talk about a one world government. I guess this will be a good segue. And then you, who are one of the heretics of the time, uh, the machine comes down on you, and then comes to defame, discredit, demonize. And as you talk about a one world government, which I think anybody would have to be stupid to deny, call it the new world order, which was the term when I was growing up. You have to be stupid or blind to deny that something is going on. It involves uh, the WEF. It involves the WHO. It involves uh, some international organization of unelected officials usurping national independence. As you talk about this, they come out and call you anti-Semitic, which was a surprising one, and all sorts of names. What was that scandal that occurred earlier on in 2023? Well, for me... Yeah, for you personally, because I know this is oh, what I well, reached out as a, I said, you got to come yeah, back yeah, yeah. on. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, for well, it. no, um, well, uh, I think I've been, I'm, I'm quite routinely accused of of, of anti-Semitism now. Um, I I couldn't put a date on it, but it's there on the record. It's there in one of the monologues that I did for GB News. A long time ago now, well, in the context of the, you know, the three years of the of the whole thing, uh, where I I was aware of, well, like many, I was aware of the fact that people who were unjabbed were being othered. That's an interesting verb that evolved, wasn't it? Being othered. Uh, but people were being othered and they were being vilified as vectors of disease because they were not taking the medical product gene therapies they were they were vectors of disease and i said on a monologue within a monologue that othering people as vectors of disease is the on-ramp to a motorway that in within living memory has gone to a very dark place because once you decide that people are dirty they're unclean touched by something that you do not want to be touched by, then you invite yourself and wider society to drive them to the edges or worse. I said that, so don't do not do this. Because when I was at school uh, in Scotland, in you know state education in Scotland, we were definitely taught that it was our obligation to remember the Holocaust. And that in order to make the remembering of the Holocaust meaningful in any way, we had to be mindful to use the lesson to enable us to hold up a red flag or flash a red light when we saw something that made us think we're, we might be, the ship of state might be turning in that direction. And I don't want to get, I don't want it to get any closer. And I don't care if I'm calling it too early, I'd still rather call it now than let it go by. I was raised like that. And so with that in mind, when I saw the othering of people on the basis of, oh, they're not, they're not taking the medicine, so they're dirty, I thought, hang on, I, that, that rings a dark bell for me. And that let, sounds... me, let me bring it up so that, I mean, I just, it takes five seconds to, uh, for those who were not aware, p- people think it started Okay, and at the risk of being called a safe, a self-hating Jew and an anti-Semite, whatever, too, too bad. It's, it's. I'm, I'm past that point now. People think that the Holocaust started with the Jews in camps, and forget that a. On the one hand, it started with medical killings of, of uh, mentally challenged, uh, mercy killings in hospitals, and when that, you know, went according to plan, then it escalated. But it was literal propaganda. It didn't, it didn't go right to killing Jews, gypsies, and blacks. It started off with. Uh, they are vectors of disease, liter- literally, to justify yeah. segregation, to literally justify what you call the, you know, the, the, the on-ramp or the, 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 the on-ramp to, to, to what it became. And we're seeing it in real time now. And, you know, another Mark and- Twain, it's history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And whether or not you've been on an on-ramp to millions of people dying or being killed as a result of another intervention, y- you got to the point where they used the same tactics that ended in millions of people, if not dying, and I think it is dying, being uh, adversely affected by that which they... Go for it. 
And that what what I was I was accused. I mean, I, I knew about it in advance, but it's relativizing the Holocaust. It's com, it's it's having the temerity to compare anything since to what happened then is a crime. I mean, you get people get sent to jail in some of the German states for comparing anything in the modern times to what happened during World War II. So I, it, it, it reached the point of Kafkaesque absurdity that I uh, brought on to GB News as a guest, Vera Sharaf, whose name will be known to many of your listeners, I'm quite sure, and to yourself, Vera Sharaf is a, a an octogenarian uh, lady living now in North America, but she was she was born in Eastern Europe, and when she was a little girl, she and her mother spent time in a concentration camp. She's Jewish, Vera Sharaf, and she spent time with her mother. She survived it, as did her mother, but she, Vera survived it and quite quickly came to the West and or, or to North America, where she has lived out her life. And she has campaigned for decades about the necessity to make sure that what happened before doesn't happen again. Vera has been accused in her absence in Germany of being a Holocaust denier. Although she, although she makes plain that she spent time in a, in a concentration camp for being Jewish, she is a she has been convicted, I think, in absentia of being a Holocaust denier. And, you know, and I, had her, I had her on my show because she, Vera made a, a documentary called uh, Never Again Is Now, where she reiterates the necessity to pay attention to the Nuremberg Code and the way in which the Nuremberg Code was being uh, corrupted during COVID by f forcing, coercing or even mandating people to take medical procedures against their will. Now that's like page one, clause one of the Nuremberg Code that was learned in the aftermath of what happened during the Holocaust, that people were not to be submitted to medical procedures without their consent. And Vera has spent a lifetime pushing the, the Nuremberg Code. And I had, I had Vera on my show to talk about that documentary and she and I have both been called anti-Semitic. Now, it's, she's it's, been called anti-Semitic for a lot longer than me. She's got a lifetime of it behind her as a concentration camp survivor. And because I wanted to say this, some of this here re reminds me of that there, that makes me an anti Semitic person. And if that's the price I have to pay to flag the things I need to be flagged, well, so be it. it but it's, it's stupid beyond words. There's there is no way to address the level of stupidity where it's Kafka-esque or Orwellian. You have Larry Elder, who's the black face of white supremacy. Uh, <laughs> you had another guy who they just called, oh, uh, Eric, Ad Eric Adams, a black Democrat in New York, they now call him Black Trump. Uh, you, you accuse Holocaust survivors of being anti-Semites, Jews of being Nazis. I mean, I get called a Nazi every now and again on Twitter. I, I don't care at all. It's, it's a level of insanity, but also the devaluation of language to the point where nothing means anything. And it almost, to me, seems like part of the plan to, to, to devalue words of meaning so that discourse becomes impossible. But the ultimate paradox, and as you say it, it, it also again becomes clear, Naivider, never again, was the message of the Holocaust. If it's such a singularly unique event in history that it can never be compared to anything, well then, A, saying never again is definitional because it's so unique you can never compare it, it can never happen again. Or, in fact, it's never again and you need to draw the lessons from the Holocaust, which are, in a way, not much different than drawing the lessons from Stalinism, not much different than drawing lessons from uh, the Khmer Rouge, the, the, you know, the Mao Revolution. It's, it's not much different than learning any lessons from any historical atrocity as to how it happened. So it's either never again in that it's impossible, therefore you can't learn anything from it, or it's never again in that you need to learn something from it, and that means comparing it uh, at different stages. It's, it's like it's never again is either an, it's either a noun or a verb. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, it's either something that is or it's something you do. It's like belief, actually. It's like religion to continue that thought. You know, for never again to mean anything, it has to be every day, every moment of every day. has it, it, Some part of your awareness has to be that there are things that you do not allow to happen. You know, they must never happen again. Otherwise, you just park it somewhere like a, like a milestone or a gravestone. You know, gravestones are all well and good because they tell you that, that someone's here and something happened to them then. But far more important is to have something dynamic and alive. And as, as Vera Sharaf's uh, series title said, never again is now. Never again is all the time. And, you know, the, the, the resistance to totalitarianism, to authoritarianism and to horror you know, you know, um, Hannah Arendt in the in the Eich, you know covering the Eichmann trial. You know, she talked about the banality of evil. You know, where Eichmann pretty much testified that well, he didn't he didn't know anybody was getting killed. He just did his job, and that's that. You know, I was only obeying orders thing, and but but she said that what she was looking on at was the banality of evil. That it's not. It, it's just about people turning a blind eye, being willfully blind and not imagining that, that their contribution is part of the problem, that they're just, they're just doing their job. That's the banality of evil. And we see, you know, we see that all around us. And that's the least of it, because there are also, without a shadow of a doubt, definitely people who are proactively pushing towards a dark place. And they are out there in plain sight. You know, trans, transhumanism is eugenics. Transhumanism is predicated upon the notion that the human species is imperfect. They, they couch it in terms like we need an upgrade. But what they're basically saying is that we're not good enough. And that without an upgrade, which is the fusing of the flesh with technology, that the people left behind become redundant, useless, useless mouths, youth, useless, useless eaters. And you know, and, and back in the original times of eugenics, before, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, before eugenics took on the, the colour that it did, the, the, the negativity that it did and deserved during the Nazi era. People wrote and spoke about useless mouths. And now in the in the time of transhumanism in the 21st century, you've got people talking about useless eaters. It's the same thing. It's a different name for us for exactly the same contempt for people. And, and, and that contempt for people, that disgust at people that is manifest in the the so-called green movement and agenda 21 notions of sustainability net zero it's all predicated upon and exploits three generations of teaching children that we are the problem and teaching children that we are the problem is where all the worst stuff comes from. Well, that's bring, bringing back some now recollections of COVID in Canada and getting those kids on stage to talk about what should be done to the unvaccinated. Cut them off little by little until they submit is what the little girl said in French. Uh, did, as, as part of the controversy, and I call it controversy, it's bullshit. I, I, I've now stopped, I've started swearing, that's it. I'm, I'm like, I'm off, the, uh, I'm off the wagon. As part of this bullshit, <laughs> they were trying to get GB to drop you from your Saturday night uh, series? Oh, oh God, honestly, uh, where do I begin? <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, this, I mean, I don't know how, to your audience, I'll, back in 2014, there was a referendum on Scottish... Um, uh, independence, as it was pitched, the, the continuation or the breakup of the United Kingdom. Um, and I put my head above the parapet and said I wanted the United Kingdom to 
to continue. Now you that's a whole other that's a whole other episode of of this podcast. But ever ever since then, I have been a bit of a lightning rod for uh, you know controversy one sort or another, because a lot of people, because of what I said then, any opportunity now to you know to fire some air pellets at me is you know is is good enough. Now, since I so so there was a kind of a reservoir of of that kind of um, antipathy, and then when I put my head above the parapet around, you know, COVID and and lockdowns and 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 the and the injectables and so on, um, I, I attracted, I attracted even more of it, and I have been. I mean, I, I was dropped by in the, so in that period of time, in the last three years, I've been. I used to be the. I was the president of the National Trust for Scotland. That a, a, a voluntary thing, you know, president, no money. That's that's not for. That's not nothing. President of the National Trust yeah, well, for Scotland. Yeah, well, and let me let me just tell you, just for history, I was, there have only ever been nine presidents of the National Trust for Scotland, and all of the preceding presidents were marquises you know they were dukes of the they were aristocracy or higher now i was born in a council i was born in social housing right so i was i was i was a break from the norm and i'm the only one to be dropped in the way that i was okay i used to be a patron of a charity called combat stress which was a charity that that I drew attention to the plight of people suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. I've been dropped by them. I do, used to do, be part. Do they give you a reason, or do is it just known? Like they yeah, know, they you challenge know they me. Know. They say that we don't we don't like the line. The, the combat stress didn't like the line that I took, where I said that the few would have to fight the many, and they didn't like the allusion to the few of the Battle of Britain. Because they they thought that I was using the metaphor of the few, never in the field of human combat has so much been owed by so many to so few, and because I wouldn't wind back on what I had said about that, I was dropped by combat stress. I was dropped by a, a group called These Islands, which was a group that actually stood up for the continuation of the United Kingdom in the face of the calls for uh, Scottish separatism. I was dropped by them. I used to write a column for the Sunday Times newspaper, which is a national newspaper, dropped by them. I, I used to have an agent. I parted company with my agent. I used to be a patron of the National Association of Lighthouse Keepers because of <laughs> Coast. I did I a mean, television series called Coast, which was all about the coastline of the UK. And I visited, oh, I've visited more lighthouses than I could shake a stick at. But somewhere along the line, I was contacted by the Association of Lighthouse Keepers, for whom I had been a patron for 15 years and told that my services were no longer required. I, it, Neil, over and on, over again. I got to stop you on the lighthouse one, because that, <laughs> uh, that one strikes me as being the most patently absurd. It's bizarre. Lighthouse keepers who have the most solitary job on earth. Uh, I say that as a joke, but uh, so what did, you, what, what did you do for the Lighthouse Keepers Association? I was just, they approached, in every instance, every instance that I've just, they came to me. And pe so people over the years have come and said, you know, because you're doing stuff about coast and, you know, and you're visiting lighthouses and you're telling the stories of, of how lighthouses came to be and, and, and how important they are for, you know, keeping safe the lives of people on the sea, would you be a name that we could just, you know, use as a, you know, just to be someone to give a, a visible <laughs> face this was 15 years ago, maybe more. Yeah, I'm just trying said, to think, yeah. like, what bad publicity are they worried about? <laughs> like, well, because, say, well, because, because subsequently, because during the COVID, this is all, it all happened in the last three years. Because I put my head up and said, I don't think that we're hearing enough about what's going on. And I've got questions and I don't like what's happening. All of those organizations have severed, well, I'm, Let's just cut to the chip. I'm no longer connected to any of those organizations. I, oh, oh, I used to be, I was five years ago, I was invited to be a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, right? It's quite an august, it's quite a prestigious 
or I don't know, there's about 1,500 fellows of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. I don't know. They came to me. I said, oh, oh, that, that's very nice of you. Yeah, why not? And I went along with it. And then while I was on holiday in Crete with my family about, I don't know, about a month ago, I got an email from the Royal Society of Edinburgh saying, we think your views as you express them on GB News are incompatible with membership. And we would like you to make a statement clarifying your position. Mm. And I said, I resign. <laughs> to me, any organisation that is uh, unwelcoming to different points of view is anathema, antithetical to my worldview. You know, the, the Royal Society of Edinburgh advertises itself as a non-partisan scientific body. It's, it's got, it runs back into the, I don't know, the early 1700s. It said all sorts of characters, luminaries, as, as, as fellows over the years. And they said to me, oh, you'll, your, your views are incompatible. So things like my views on climate crisis and my views on the, the injectables and so on and so on were incompatible with fellowship. So I just said, I'm out. <laughs> I don't want to be associated with you. That's actually the most recent one. So, uh, and, and people, every time, every time I say anything that, that, that catches headlines, People go after my publisher. I write books. I've written, I don't know, a dozen books over the years. People go after my uh, go after bookshops and and go after bookshops in the UK and around the world and say, why are you host why are you selling books written by this guy? <laughs> and it, you know, that's that's the that's the that's the reality that I've been living in. Now I'm not saying, you know, love me, love me, it's a shame. I'm just saying. That's what's happened. And absolutely, and with God, with Trudy's, my wife's backing and all of the rest of it, our position on every one of these organisations that comes to me and takes that stance, Trudy says to me, tell them to get to... <laughs> and I do. I, I'm trying to find the tweet because, I mean, what you're describing is almost as absurd. I don't know if you follow this out of Canada. The Juno Beach Museum. Uh, in in France, on the beach in Normandy, France, which Juno, you know, yeah, Juno. There's a Canadian foundation. It's a Canadian museum. It's funded by the government. They put out a tweet saying, uh, "It's come to our attention that someone claiming to associate with Juno Beach uh, made some political tweets, which we disavow. We don't support Tamara Leach, the woman who's on trial now for mischief." for supporting the convoy and we don't support the freedom convoy and they put freedom convoy in quotes this is like world war ii veterans saying we don't support the freedom convoy literally and it's it it's as patently absurd it's absurd uh, i know that if i were in your shoes i would say good riddance to bad rubbish but i would have a very very cynical taste in my mouth that how stupid can people be i i have a family friend <laughs> who doesn't want to see me and I didn't know it. And I ran into them on the street. I was like, hey, come. I, I rolled down the window, say hi. And my wife's like, dude. Da, da, da. And then I, she told me after, I was like, you didn't know this. They don't want to talk to you. And I was like, in each, in each instance that I've just listed, you know, I mean, it, the people that, you know, the, the, the Association of Lighthouse Keepers, you know, it publishes a monthly magazine or whatever. The, the National Trust for Scotland looks after, takes care of, you know, innumerable, valuable, historically important properties all up and down the country. Combat stress. It looks after you know, post-traumatically traumatised, uh, post-stress traumatised veterans of combat. I, I don't think for one minute that the wider uh, constituency congregations of those organizations are even aware of what a handful of board members or whatever in each instance whatever national trust for scotland you know the whatever it's just a group of a half a dozen people in each instance that have thought oh right he's um he's running against the orthodoxy that's not that's not good for our ESG, you know, our environment, societal and governance, uh, you know, uh, we are good people, tech. So let's let's cut them adrift. 
So the people, the people, I am with the people. I am of the people with the people. And I know that the people are, you know, in huge numbers are of the same opinion as me. So when I when I'm talking when I'm talking about these organizations, it's the running of them. It's the it's the petty minded bureaucrats that operate them that have decided, oh well, we better not all of the all of the you know, every single one of them, without exception, came to me. I'm just minding my bit on my own business. And they say, <laughs> well, they, Can we can we have your name on our letterhead? Or can we put your photograph on our website and associate ourselves with you? And then as soon as something comes along in the present era where they think, oh, that's slightly controversial cut them adrift no, if that's the caliber of these people i don't want anything to do with their organizations i couldn't well, the, be i couldn't be free of them quicker the problem is it seems to be the caliber of many people in positions of power now it's 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 like the superficial actions to garner uh you know esg like social credit it's the superficial you know easy things to do that yeah. are the dumbest, that, that they don't face enough social, political, economic backlash for doing it. But I, now I, I'm going to ask this question about, about Eric, um, oh geez, this is uh, Stein. What's Stein's first name? Mark. I wanna say Mark. And I don't want to, I, I don't want to like, look like I'm creating strife among, among GB. I know it's, I, first of all, I like the outlet and I think they've given voices to people who deserve them, such as yourself. But Mark Stein also himself found himself in a problem with GB ultimately resigned. This was also earlier this year. Uh, what, I mean, there's some other, there's some circumstances to that, but what, for those of us out in North America who don't fully know the story, what, what happened with Mark Stein? Well, well I was, I was and I'm, and I'm very unhappy about ha what happened to Mark. I loved Mark. I, mean, I love Mark. I <laughs> shouldn't put that in past tense. I love Mark. And um, he, uh, he, he, he came on board uh, I think once GB News was up and running for, I don't know, maybe six months, or I can't remember exactly when, and he came on board and he instantly became, for my wife and I, appointment television, as they say. He was on at eight o'clock, I think, on an evening, and we, right, it's Mark, you know, when, and we sat down and watched him because he was he is brilliant. You know, he's, his his journalism, his, his insight, his humour... I can't praise him highly enough. And and I said before, and I've said since, that he was the jewel in the crown. But to, to me, he crystallised and epitomised what GB News should be. He was a loud, proud gadfly, deliberately, cleverly and accurately sticking his pointed proboscis into the flesh of the lumbering horse of the state and when what happened happened i was devastated i was in touch with them then and throughout the whole pe the whole process you know i mean you say to clarify it for for your audience gb news in the uk broadcasts on uh, um, terrestrial television along with BBC, Channel 4, Sky, all of the rest of them. And if you do that in the UK, you sign a bit of paper as a broadcaster saying that you will conform to Ofcom rules. Ofcom is an ombudsman regulator for terrestrial television in the UK. Now, make no mistake, Ofcom is a mouthpiece of the, of the government. It's there to push the, the state establishment orthodoxy. It, it, it flies under false colours of seeking balance and equality, but it's just there to make sure that the state line is pushed and not compromised. And so, you know, in order to be... I, I've used the analogy before that if you want to play football... You could play in the park with uh, jumpers for goalposts and 50 aside and picking up the ball and running with it if you want. You can do your own thing. If you want to play in the football association, you sign a bit of paper saying you'll have 11 aside and you'll watch the offside rule and all of the rest of it. GB News took the decision to be in amongst 
Manchester United and Liverpool and and the rest of them. And so it's obligated to you know follow Ofcom rules. When Mark was saying what he was saying, Ofcom were challenging him. Mark, I think absolutely rightly, wanted to damn the fear and see Ofcom in court. Let's see if this organisation has teeth. And and what he was saying, because it's Orwellian as well, he was he got in trouble for de- denying was, the efficacy of the jab, uh, yeah, among other he things. He was he was saying at the you know at the time you know you know a, a few of us were saying you know this thing about safe and effective that's that's a colander that's leaking water like a colander and uh, the vaccine injured of whom there are uncounted numbers because no one's paying proper attention to them uh, he was given voice to to people who were hurt and people who's who had coroner's reports saying that their loved ones had died because of the injectables and mark was given he took that up he took up the cudgels on their behalf and ofcom didn't like it one bit and ofcom wanted them wanted them to back down and mark wouldn't god love him god bless him and because of the ofcom regulations that gb news are operating under they there was a i am not privy to conversations that's the that's the honest truth i don't i don't know what actually happened in the conversations verbatim but there was a parting of the ways mark went his way and gb news went their way you know and i yeah. i understand you know gb news is a company seeking to swim in those waters Mark was Mark Stein, you know, genius, one of a kind, uh, inspirational figure. And there was a parting of the ways. And I have been sad about it. And I think GB News has been desperately the less for his absence ever since. Oh, I've said that, I said that then and I say it now. It's analogous to, I mean, well, I guess t- Fox News fired Tucker Carlson, but it's analogous to losing your, your among your biggest, most populous, um, populist voices. Um, and by the way, the Ofcon, it sounds exactly like CanCon in Canada, Canadian content requirements under the Broadcast Act, which applies to radio and television. And mm-hmm. now, thanks to new legislation, to uh, online streaming and online accounts who now have to, who will be governed by the government in terms my, of what they- my, my personal, you know, as a, I, you know, I, I you know, as a as I as a person, I've been I've been self-employed for you know almost all of my life, and with that hat on, I say, you know, I would I I would I would stand shoulder to shoulder with Mark's opinion that you face off common court, you know, or 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 the or the or the or the legislative regulatory equivalent thereof. I would say bring it on, because there's a you know there's a there are there are degrees of submission, you know. You you can like cave early because you don't want the fuss, or you can go. Do you know what? I'll see you in court, or it's equivalent. That's where I want to go. You know, I I've, I'm past the point now. You know, I whatever, if people if people want to come after me, and they come after me all the time for you know accusations of this, that, or the other. And there's all sorts of little groups of all sorts of you know motivated and and it, and it would appear you know financed individuals that you know that that come after me with a view to you know, causing trouble for me and I say right <laughs> let's do it let's do it I'll see you in the car park what if I may ask do you know what Mark is doing now has he started his he's got own... his own channel he's got he's I I, I I'm I, I, the the technology of it he's Mark Stein Live, no, Mark Stein Online, Mark Stein Online sits on a server that Mark and that Mark controls. So he is independent of the the whole system. As far as I understand it, you know, technologically, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit, I'm a bit primitive. Now, when Dora, it comes I, to I think it's, I think it's Stein online. At least that's what I just found by Google. Yes. Okay. Stein okay, online. Stein online. S T E Y N online. online. 
and the the servers upon which his content sits are controlled by him and only him. Obviously, he's on the internet, so at some level, you know, at, at some level, he's I don't know. I suppose he's 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 under the umbrella of the internet. Yeah. But you know, he's he's away from whatever YouTube, even you know, even more sort of freedom seeking platforms. I suppose like Rumble and and whatever. But Mark sits on his own. <laughs> Basically, I, I think a, a a computer under his desk. That's that's. I mean, it, what's an amazing thing is it's it's more than enough. And I don't know. I mean, I don't know what GB's viewership was, but you know, I, I think a lot of independent, yeah. lower what's the word, lower overhead creators, lower overhead journalists get more viewership on yeah. Substack, on Rumble, on their Twitter accounts than they would get on CNN. Um, I, I don't want to be too greedy with your time, uh, Neil. How much time do you have? Just keep going. Okay. okay well, uh, now, so that's the G, that's the GB part. Um, the historical part. I said I wanted to. We we did the bit of the fall of Rome, but at, what did happen to Romans after the fall of Rome? Like I, we always talk about it. They, they got taken over to the south by. Um, I want to say this. I'm not. I'm going to embarrass myself. What happened to Romans after the fall of Rome? You know. Roman archaeology and Roman Roman history is not is not really my forte, but they they were just the the cohesion fell apart. So what had been administered by Romans f from Rome uh, lost its uh, center of gravity. Although Rome in the Rome in the West you know, fell apart in the 400s AD. But already um, a, an Eastern Roman Empire, like a like the Eastern franchise of the Roman Empire was already established in what became, what became at that time the city of Constantinople, which is now Istanbul. And that was the Eastern Roman Empire which, you know, became, in the fullness of time, became the, the, the Byzantine Empire, which lasted until 1453, when it was overwhelmed finally by um, the, uh, the Seljuk Turkish Muslim Caliphate. But what had been the Western Roman Empire centred on Rome simply lost its cohesion and fell apart and fell into... Uh, you you fractured into you know smaller and smaller pieces. Y Europe Europe entered obviously. Uh, for example, where I, uh, there had been um, Britannia was the Roman province was a Roman province governed from Rome, paying its taxes. Uh, occupied by Roman soldiers and all of the rest of it B during the 400s AD, that just drifted away. They they repatriated most of their soldiers, and that that happened all over the Roman Empire. It just that cohesion that had been Rome, the glory that was Rome, was no more. And Europe, Western Europe particularly entered into what was called the Dark Age, well, what historians for a long time called the Dark Ages. Dark in that they imagined it was without the illumination of the ancient world, the illumination of Rome, the illumination of Greece, and the, and the, and the great, you know, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle of the, of the great, uh, you know, the, the, the Greek pantheon of philosophers. So, so Europe... It was said from about the 400s onwards and, and for about three or 400 years descended into a time of darkness, which isn't really true. It was portrayed that way by, by subsequent historians who preferred to perpetuate the idea that, that it had been better under Rome. But there was, there was learning and there was, you know, the, the Book of Kells and the, and the great, the Lindisfarne, the Lindisfarne Gospels, the beautiful irreplaceably wonderful works of art were created uh, you know during that time when uh, after Rome and, and before you get but by the time of about 800 AD so Rome's gone by the 400s the late 400s 500s 
And then in 800 uh, AD, you've got um, Charlemagne, Big Charlie, who is crowned Holy Roman Emperor, Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope in Christmas Day in 800 AD in a self-conscious, deliberate reincarnation of the notion of Rome. Charlemagne, by his by his belligerence and his military might and his force of personality and his politicking had pulled together basically the Roman Empire. <laughs> he'd, re he'd reconstituted it from its disparate parts such that the it suited the, the Pope in Rome to crown him holy Roman Empire, holy, sacred Roman Empire, put a crown on his head as the, as the Roman Empire, pulled it together. And the... And ever since, you know, since Rome, the, the, the edifice that was pulled together under the Caesars uh, that then fell apart, that was then pulled back together again under Charlemagne and, and, and held together unsuccessfully by his heirs, reformed under, the, under Hitler. He, Hitler was trying to pull together the same thing again, the Reich, poof, gone. Then the European Union, pulling pulling together as one all these disparate entities, including Britannia, you know, pulling it all together again. You know that that has been the objective of people for two thousand years, and still it goes on. Well, and still it goes on. And now, perfect segue because I was going to ask: This is the state of the European Union now. First of all, Brexit happened. Practically speaking, what has it changed in Europe and how has it been implemented? <laughs> God, go for big questions. Well, I mean, Br Br I think actually this thought was first, first voiced by my wife, Trudy. You know, we're talking about this stuff all the time. It's years ago now. I can't remember when she said it. But she said, the, the, for you, I'm sure you've, your listeners know the, the the Brexit referendum was 2016, where Britain was given a, a vote on do you want to stay part of the European Union or do you want to not be part of the European Union? And by a vote of 52 to 48%, Britain voted to leave the European Union. That was not in the script. Yep. It was the same year as Trump not Trump. being in the script. I mean, it's like now, the this is where of the get, Matrix. Yeah. This, is, this is where we get to the bit that... Yeah. My wife said to me, she said, she said since, if if the Americans had voted for Hillary, as they were supposed to, and the British had voted to stay in Europe, we would never have had the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, or the climate crisis. Everything that has unfolded in Europe and the horror show in America is a my wife says, a punishment beating for voting for Trump and voting for Brexit. And I think she's hit the nail squarely on the head. It, it, it's an amazing thing. I, I was having this discussion with someone the other day where uh, talk, it was 9-11 was, it was related, where I, I was explaining some of the conspiracy theories that, you know, the government either allowed it to happen, had a hand in it happening, whatever. And then the person says, well, why would the government want to kill? I mean, the government would never kill 3,000 American citizens. And I was like, D -d -d like, when you hear what Madeleine Albright says eight years later about 500,000 dead Iraqi babies being worth the regime change, 3,000 American, what do you think? It it's a drop in the bucket. I, I, contextualizing in the early days of the pandemic where people were saying they're lying about the numbers, they're inflating them, or now that I've read the real Anthony Fauci, uh, implementing policy which is deliberately going to exacerbate the numbers so they can be weaponized. Look, I, uh, the, the cost of a human life, it's a statistic at those levels for those who want to implement policy. I think I might be inclined to agree with your wife. <laughs> but, you don't, um, yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to, you, you, the extent to which governments, democratic, authoritarian, whatever, the extent to which governments are enthusiastic about killing people and destroying infrastructure, frankly, we lack the grammar and adjectives to describe the extent of it. 
what whatever i mean the 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 people died the very notion that a government wouldn't have contemplated that perpetrated that executed that that's irrelevant look at the first world war look at the the millions the tens of millions dead look at the second world war look at you know look at the excesses of you know uh, stalin what 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 we're looking at there 50 70 million dead what we're looking at with mao 80 100 million dead what we're looking at with um pol pot in cambodia 2 million dead the the heap of slain that has been piled by democratic and authoritarian governments, and I put those two words, democratic and totalitarian, in inverted commas for all the difference it makes. Come on. A few thousand here or there? For, for, for And what I say, uh, to be cynical, a few thousand for the government control, what some believe to be the beginning of the end of, of American you know, internal policy freedom. Um, and, and, you know, again, you know, history making sense backwards where people said, how, I said growing up, how do 50, 40, 30 million people starve to death? And then flash forward to 2020, 2023, where you're talking about policies that interrupt this, the beautiful ecosystem of civilization, you know, supply chains. And what ends up happening? You can't even get good food out. They predicted, I mean, Bill Gates back in the day predicted hundreds of millions might die from starvation as a result of COVID interference with all of these supply chain infrastructure civilization yeah. itself. And then you understand how it happened. Oh, well, it's a, it's a footnote in history now of that atrocity. Will this ever be the same C footnote in history? Yes, in, in Kissinger, years? Henry Kissinger, at least him, whether it was his own idea or whether he was just repeating somebody else's understanding said, well, I mean, to paraphrase, if you can control the energy and the money and the food, then you control everything. That's how it's done. That's how it's been done since the dawn of civilization. That you, you control that, you control those three elements. And previously, state reach wasn't there. Not not even for not even for St Stalin, you know, with the with the way in which he inflicted, you know, famine on Ukraine and killed, God knows how many millions, Mao in China and the you know and the and the Great Leap Forward and the and the millions, the 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 state capacity was always limited by whatever by bureaucracy and ultimately by technology. And for the first time now, because of the the spliced interconnected supply chains, the the money markets, the control of the money supply by the by the banking cartels, everything's possible now. The, that that dreamed of, that fantasy of control of energy, money, and food is there. And we will see what happens next. Well, I'm going to say, hopefully it's not 80 million. But and hopefully, ho hopefully when, when, when the, the good side am, prevails, I'll be alive see, to see it. Can I, I think it's, I, I'm, it's important. I, say, I, am, I say all these things and people say to me, and my wife says to me, God, don't be so bleak. I'm not really, I'm not really, I'm just listing. I'm just, li I'm just saying out loud the things that I think. I, I absolutely believe that the, what's, the 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 hegemony the the totalitarianism the, the the one world government the the whatever the centralization will fail because it always does because it runs counter to human nature to the to the it runs it runs counter to the to the human animal itself and the the you know I've, just some people say you know when something gets too big it's too big to fail no, eventually everything becomes so big it must fail. We watched, we watched the collectivization of the Soviet Union that, that from the Second World War to a, li a lifetime, pretty much a lifetime, and it fell. It ran out of everything, ran out of energy. Yeah, just, oh, fuck it. Can't be bothered with it anymore. It's done. 
they always fail. The European Union will fail. It'll fu- it'll fragment. Brexit was you know was a was a an outlier, but it will it will fragment. And whatever ridiculously aggrandized, over the top version of collectivization that is being pulled together under the umbrella of whatever it is, the Great Reset or one world government or, or 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 our title we don't even know it's going to fail it's a wounded be it might even be dead now it's a but at the very least it's a severely wounded beast and as we all know from the tarzan movies there's nothing more dangerous than a wounded beast whatever it is a water buffalo with too many spears in it it'll 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 run for a while and it'll create mayhem in its death throes, but it will, it's dead already. It will die. And it's going to be a hell of a mess. But I I, I hope, you, you know, people get from this what I think, which is whenever, however, I don't put time, I don't, I don't claim to know how long things will take, but this will pass. King Solomon used to wear a ring on his yep. finger that said, this too yes. shall pass, because somebody wiser than him, wiser than Solomon, was reminding him, this too shall pass. I just want to be here when it does, Neil. Neil, um, first of all, we, we can... <laughs> do you have 50... Do you have a few more minutes if we go yeah. to locals and take some questions there? Everybody, yes. I think this is a good place to end it on Rumble. It doesn't change anything here. And if everybody wants to come on over to Locals, there's, I know there's some questions that are there for you specifically. So I'm going to end this on Rumble. Come over to vivabarneslaw.locals.com. A few more questions. Uh, I, 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 and everyone in the chat saying we could listen to you all day, but that wouldn't be fair. So I'm going to end this on Rumble. We're going to have some questions for you on Locals uh, <laughs> right now. Okay, so first of all, it, it, and you say that, it, you know, th- that's a beautiful thing to have. Uh, the thought is there is no such thing as too big to fail. It, it's inevitably, it gets too big, it must. And as you say it, I think even universes, they, ext- they expand until they expand out of existence. And that's the nature of even the universe. Um, be- it's, and it's beautifully put. Oh my goodness. Okay, I'm going to see if I got some questions in here. They're going to be random, so so if, I hope that you don't mind that. Fenja 1987 says, Neil, which historic era is your favorite? If there is a way to answer that question. Oh my, I, mean, <laughs> I can only answer that honestly. I can only answer that honestly. I, I studied archaeology at university in the 1980s, 1984 to 1988 to be precise. And I, I was then, and I have been ever since, preoccupied by the Neolithic. I'm f- I'm fascinated by the time when people who had hunted for um, two million years, one species of humankind or another, became farmers. And it was a drawn out process where they, 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 they moved from the one to the other. And that liminal transitional period absolutely fascinates me. Because I think that so much that even is even now is still happening is a consequence of us coming to terms with what we did then. We've been farmers for ten thousand years out of seven million <laughs> years. It's a blink of an eye. Our dietary conditions, people being wheat intolerant, dairy intolerant, all. Also, I mean, I, I, you know, you can, you know, obviously, all sorts of other contributory factors, but the, we we harbour, I believe, as a as animals, a kind of guilt about what we did to the way we used to be and what we have become since, and I think in the short term it manifests itself in the raising of the great stone circles and the preoccupation with the lights in the sky. And I think what those many, many generations that came through that transitional period and then into the working of metal, can you imagine living through a time when people started making metal blades? 
from I not, stone. That's what I mean. I don't even understand where they got the idea. Like obsidian, obsidian uh, weapons. I can understand. You just see something, break it, and make it. To yeah. to, to refine minerals and you, transform it. You you imagine you f someone makes finds a kind of stone which has to be like you know copper tin a lot, and some of it appears as 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 metal. A lot, it's ore. It's white powder in the rock. And you, you learn somehow that if you put that in the fire and bring it together with another white powder, that it then becomes a liquid that you can pour into a mold and seconds later you can draw a sword. The sword in the stone. <sighs> Pulling a sword from a stone. Magic of a kind, the impact of which we cannot even begin to contemplate. All of that is it's happening across a long span of time. But that transition from people who had hunted and lived like that for millions of years, and then they go through a transition into people who farm and domesticate animals and grow crops and make metal and bury their dead and set their dead on fire and send smoke up into heaven. That period, if you can call it a historical period, that's... <laughs> I think about that every day. You make history poetry, Neil. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm going to sit here. A, a work of Marx says Neil Oliver is the shining beacon of truth and hope. No matter what, keep it up. Fuck the slings and arrows. Resident, re, resident Bedouin asks, does Neil encourage countries to celebrate the ethnic diversities within their boundaries? I'm not sure I understand. Well, that's a, I'm, that's a, that's a big question. I think well, I'll, I'll go for it this way. I'll, I'll approach that this way. We're being, we, the, the mass of the population of the planet, are, are being, div well, the intention is to divide us, separate us, fragment us, atomize us. That book I mentioned before talks about how that's the, that, that's the objective, right? Take people from belonging to family, to community, to their deep history in a place, maybe where the people have always been. You separate people from that and you persuade them that they're just single entities, atoms. You've atomized those people. And then you can do with them whatever you will. So much of it is about divisiveness. When it, celebrating you know, the, the, the ethnicity, People, the vast majority of people, just want peace. They want to be, they want their property protected. They want their families to be safe. They want the opportunity to have their children educated. They want their families to have enough to eat. And they're quite happy to get along with their neighbours, as long as their neighbours are motivated along the same lines. We are driven by nefarious types to be divided one from another. People do like, they absolutely do like to cleave together with people that they recognise that look like them. That's okay. Because people that do that can still rub along happily with neighbours who don't look like them, who are also clumping and clustering together to do their own thing. There can still be a level of coming together and sharing and celebrating. What you've got to fight against all the time are those nefarious elements that want to divide us along the lines of race and religion. I've got, I've got Christian friends. I consider myself a Christian person. I'm a, I've, I've got Muslim friends. I've got Sikh friends. I've got Zoroastrian friends. I, 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 I don't care what colour people are. It's, I've got Jewish friends. I've got, I'm supposed to be going to a conference in Tel Aviv with, with, with Jewish friends that I've got. It's of no interest to me. It doesn't matter to me. I just want peace. And I know in my heart that the vast majority of people just want peace. I'm only interested in other people. That's the truth. I'm interested in other people's religions and faiths and creeds. I, I, it interests me you might, I, I, all the time. I'm thinking, why are people like that? Why, why do they do that? That's interesting. Why do they do that? And all of that. We're, we have to fight. We have to resist all the time those that want to separate us on our sexualities, 
our colours, our religions and all that. We know this. When you hear somebody say it, it runs through you. Like lightning runs through a lightning conductor. And it's because it's not because the person saying it has thought of something new or revolutionary. It's just because they've said what has been true forever. Because the truth runs through us like lightning and you're delighted by it. That's all it is. You're delighted by it because it's true. And that's the that's where we need to be. Just leave people alone to sort themselves out and they will share and they will live peaceably together. Stillwater 111 says, I think Viva and Neil need to do an archaeological dig together. Neil, are you getting over? If we if you get to Florida, we can go look for megalodon teeth in... Um... There's a river. It's, I think it's called Crystal River, but it's like in the midland of, of Florida. Megalodon. And apparently you find them everywhere. You go sift through the mud and there's just yeah. megalodon teeth. These I've massive. just watched. My, my kids my kids and I and my wife, we had the kids. Uh, my kids are 20, uh, 17 and 15. They all still live at home. And la the night before last or thereabouts, we watched uh, The Meg 2. Yep. <laughs> Jason I, I, I watched i think i watched the first with my kid it's it's comedic enough that even the violence is not scary for an eight-year-old but at one, at one towards the end jason statham um kills a megalodon with a blade off a helicopter <laughs> oh megalodons yeah don't get me started on megalodons and how there's people out there um crypto paleontologists or whatever that, that that insist that they're still out there in the deep water well the, the argument for, the argument for why they could not be out there it's the same argument for Loch Ness it's it's not a question of not having seen them they need sustenance to feed a body of that big that they would leave trails of evidence I mean that's yeah. the argument what yeah was... I just I just I just I just enjoy it but you know I have to say you know what I'm hoping that people like listen because I am I'm I'm often uh, characterized as somebody very doer and and bleak and I'm really not, you know, I'm aware or I try to make myself as aware as I can be of what I think is going on. And I've got lots of questions that I want to ask. But and maybe, you've, you know, I'm aware that I possibly got slightly, you know, wild eyed this afternoon. But it's only because that is bubbling out of me what I really think, which is that everything is going to be all right. I see. I don't think you're wild. I think people calling you any names is uh, it's an offense to good sense and reason. But but there, there is no more reason left. It's it's tribalism. And it's like it's like, you know, burning. Uh, uh, it's like burning Galileo because of, of what he said. Um, but I, I mean, the way the, the uh, look, I'll just say the way you speak, I, 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 I it's poetry uh, in, in terms of how you deliver things. And it's it's wonderful. Uh, my concern for you, but it might be my own projection. It's not that you're doom pilled, but that you're optimistic, but nonetheless getting depressed at the state of the world. But, but what does one do with one's depression if that's where they're going? Well, embrace it. I think sadness gets a bad rap. Um, you know, we are sold a version of happiness that is nothing to do with happiness. Not in any, not in terms of experiencing the true texture of what it means to be human and alive. We are sold a version of happiness that's about consumption, ownership of whatever mobile phones and 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 multiple cars and homes and so on, which is not really it's not really happiness. You know, um, uh, Francis Hutchison, who was the chair of moral philosophy at Glasgow University in the seventeen sixties. And he's one of the kind of fathers of the Scottish Enlightenment, so-called. He preached to his students. He was a he was a churchman, but he was a professor at, at Glasgow University. That happiness was not something which which hitherto it had been suggested that it was something that God scattered at random. That if you were lucky, you got happy, and if you weren't, you didn't get any happy. A bit like breadcrumbs. Hutchison said that happiness was achieved by working with every fibre of your being to secure the happiness of other people, people around you. And that if you did that, if you worked hard to make other people happy, that your collateral benefit would be happiness. You would accidentally and along the way make yourself happy by that great effort to make everybody else happy. That became, one of his students was John Witherspoon, who left Scotland and 
an invitation, went to North America and became eventually the president of, the second president of Princeton College, as it was then, Princeton University, as it is now. And he was one of the signatories of the American Declaration of Independence. And there's every reason to believe that the pursuit of happiness, that form of words, was his, that he had that introduced to the Declaration of Independence and that it came ultimately from his, his Yoda, Francis Hutchison back in Glasgow, that you had to pursue, work hard for, hunt down happiness. That's the way to think of happiness, that it comes from endeavor and effort. And along the way, being sad is something that we're now medicated against. Half the population of America, I think 60% of the population of North America is rattling with antidepressants and Ritalin and I, I I don't know what because the because what's characterized as sadness, unhappiness, not happiness is something that has to be medicated for. The it's the whole texture of life that is to be experienced. And and happiness is a bit you get like sunshine through clouds, or I don't know, the laughter of your child. That's happiness. But being happy all the time is like being drunk all the time. It may sound like a good idea, but it, it's not really the basis for productivity. And so, you know, I I embrace you got you gotta embrace it. Light and shade, light and dark, happy and sad. If you know one, you know the other. You only know you're awake because you've been asleep. You only know you're happy because you've been sad. There's nothing wrong with sad. It's productive. It can be a source of great creativity. And every now and again, if you try hard enough, you make yourself happy by accident. I cannot think of a better way we're going to end this on that, uh, except to say I've been corrected. Galileo didn't get burnt. He was uh, locked in prison for the rest of his life. I meant it as a figure <laughs> of speech, people. Neil, uh, I can't thank you enough. Let's, I mean, as often as you want to do this and can do this, um, it makes me feel better. So, um, um, I, David, I'm happy to, happy to do this anytime you want. Just get in touch. Fantastic. Now, I'm going to end the stream for everybody. We'll say our proper goodbyes, but thank you very much. I'm going to put where people can find you, but where can people find you? Neil, uh, Coast Guy on, on Twitter is your handle. At the Coast Guy on Twitter. Um, I have podcasts that are available on I don't know all the places that people find podcasts. Look for me by name. It's called Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles and also Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the World. I've got a Neil Oliver site on Instagram. I've got a Neil Oliver channel on YouTube. Um, and I've got, I think I'm about to publish my latest book, which is called Hauntings, A Book of Ghosts and Where to Find Them. And it's a, it's a contemplation about why we have always seemed to need to tell each other about ghosts for 5,000 years. That'll be coming out in October. Available in all good bookshops. I'm an idiot. I knew I wanted to ask you about that earlier. When I publish this to YouTube, the full interview is going to have this part. So everyone's going to see it. And I'll put the link to that as well. Neil, thank you. Amazing. My absolute 100% pleasure. All right. We're going to end this now. Everyone, see you later.